Morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Uh, welcome to uh, quite an interesting uh, webinar today. It's our sixth webinar, Breakfast with Relog, that we've hosted. Uh, I see we have 90 participants on board already. Um, and really, we're going to do this webinar a little bit differently to what we've done before. Previously, what we had was each of the uh, panelists gave a presentation and then we move to a question and answer session. We're gonna be doing this one a little bit differently in the sense that we are we have set up six pre-questions, which we're gonna ask each um, panelist to address. And then we'll go after they've gone through all six questions and each panelist has gone through their answer on that, we'll go to a general question and answer panel discussion. So I hope you're gonna enjoy it. We've also got really some um, interesting uh, panelists on board, which is exciting from across the world, people as far away as Dubai, Austria, England, uh, and some in South Africa, um, uh, Sweden, uh, welcome. So let's move on. The six questions are, let's see if the technology will allow me. There we go. So here we have six questions. Question one, with the development of AI, artificial intelligence, IoT, and other technology, how is this changing the approach to mechanization and automation? And what are the latest trends and developments? And hopefully we'll get some sharing of some of these secrets from these suppliers. The next question is with the pandemic and the take up of e-commerce and omnichannel, this has obviously put pressure on retailers to change the way supply chains operate and to move to more singles fulfillment. Have you seen an opportunity for new systems in this area of fulfillment and throughout the supply chain? Is there any exciting new technology and operations in this space? Okay, next question. Automation is an initial cost scare to companies, but in the long term is indeed a saving. How do you build a business case appropriate to the South African market? And then the next one, automation and mechanization require different mindset and management philosophy and are also less flexible. The payback and viability is also driven by scale. Do you see the South African market and African market as a challenge to get this to work? How would you approach it? Question five, automation as it has developed is generally appropriate in a first world set setting. In the developing market where we have cheap labor and high unemployment, how do you see the deployment and appropriateness of implementing automation in South Africa and Africa? Finally, we understand that one might have to give up certain freedoms and flexibilities when using mechanization or automation. However, one would expect to gain a fair amount of control over the process and insights at how the volumes are moving throughout the system. Besides the normal dashboards uh, of volumes processed versus the remains to be processed and throughputs per station, what are the insights, what other insights are normally discovered post automation? Okay, so that's quite exciting questions. Hopefully I've got a grasp of some good questions that our team at Relog put together. And thanks to the guys to challenge everyone. The next uh, slide, let's see the technology move, uh, really says who our panelists are. We have uh, Interol, Swisslog, Knapp, Schaefer and TGW. So these are all the leading players in the world in technology and automation. I'm gonna now stop sharing and I'm gonna call on uh, Hilton at Interol to just give us a quick background to Interol and start with Hilton. Uh, you've got four minutes Hilton and I'll cut you short if you run over. Okay, guys, four welcome minutes. Hilton, thank you. I'm just gonna stop sharing and I'm assuming you've got a presentation to share on. Um, no, to be honest, I thought you guys were just going to bring it up. I emailed it last night, but I can bring it up quickly if I have Why don't you quickly bring it up? It wasn't included for me. Sorry. Uh, okay, then. Well, I hope my four minutes haven't started yet, please. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. okay. Uh, no worries. Stop um, sharing. I just need to just quickly then share my screen here. Um, uh, share screen. I must make sure I'm sharing the right screen, no doubt. Yeah. That one. Yeah, I'm assuming you can you can see it here now yeah. on my screen. Is that right? Perfect. I'm just Put gonna, it in video mode. I'm just going to start it now. There we go. Is that okay? Perfect. 
Thanks, Hilton. Four minutes first, to start sure. now. Nothing like Just going through. first. Yeah, but first of all, um, thank you very much um, to Gary and the Relog team for inviting Interall. We are excited to participate, and of course, we're sharing the stage today with um, many well-known companies in our space, um, real big leaders, as Gary alluded to, and uh, all of them actually, in fact, are Introl's customers. So we're very privileged to, to be on this panel together with, uh, with these companies. But let me tell you a little bit about Introl for those who don't know. Um, first of all, starting, of course, with myself, I'm Hilton Campbell. Um, some of you that are on um, the webinar today might know me. I'm a South African and I've spent a long time in South Africa and I'm a founding member of Intel South Africa. And today I have my colleague Ke Walker who will introduce himself in a few moments. So we started Intel South Africa in 1998. And uh, as I said, I was there and I've been involved in some of the biggest and most exciting projects that the South African market has seen um, in 2019. I had an opportunity to take up the managing director's role here for intro in the UK and Ireland, which I gladly accepted. And just before I left, we had finished um, one of our biggest exciting projects for, for um, Take A Lot, who I know um, Knapp is also involved with. And uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm applying my, my trade here. Care, he's on the, on the webinar today. I handed the reins over to Care in 2019, just before the pandemic. So sorry about that, Care, but. Um, <laughs> it had to happen and care. I don't know if you want to just quickly say a few words and then I can quickly go on. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hilton. So, yeah, so I took over from Hilton in 2019 and yeah, um, a quick pace industry and um, yeah, looking forward to, to the rest of the day with you guys. Great. Very quick video. It's only one minute long. Enjoy. Hilton, there's no sound. There's no sound. Okay. I don't know why there's no sound. So there's no sound? Not yet. No, there's no sound, Hilton. Okay. All right. That was a quick introduction, but really. sorry, I'm not a tech savvy guy when it comes to IT. I'm apologizing that there's no sound, but I can share that later. Right, Introl is a global provider for materials handling. We have um, 2,400 employees and we have 34 companies scattered around the globe with 16 main factories. Our head office is that little yellow dot there in a very nice part in Europe called Switzerland. And we have some 28,000 customers and the company was founded back in 1959. What you see on the screen now are our um, growth markets where we've identified where Intro would like to participate. And of course, I guess this mirrors many of my colleagues here, but we are particularly strong in the food and beverage sector warehousing and distribution, and of course, Kura Express Parcel and fashion retail is a hot topic, which I'm sure we're gonna dig in a bit more today. Airport technology, we also supply equipment into the airport. Today, of course, the airport technology is under some pressure, but we still see some opportunities right now, even during this pandemic. Tire automotive, of course, supermarket. Many of you have touched an intro product. If you've ever gone to a supermarket where there's a mobile checkout, in seven out of 10 cases, that conveyor is driven by one of the intro drum motors. And then we also have an industrial manufacturing sector, which I'll talk about later on during the webinar. Some of the highlights for intro is that, of course, last year, we were very fortunate to have a record result, um, a very good profitable result. Of course, this was the result of our fixed costs reducing dramatically. We are public company, so this is all available to the public. Of course, we restricted in travel. We did not do any trade shows, so our fixed costs reduced dramatically. We managed to maintain the same level in regards to sales and output, but of course, because the fixed cost reduced, we were able to increase our profit, which, which we were very um, pleased about. We have a very strong innovation pipeline. Some of it I can share with you today, Karen and I, but um, this year we launched our split tray sorter and we launched the SPM, which I will talk a bit about if there's any questions regarding that. And of course, on our lips and on many other companies' lips is the word digitalization. And that I know is going to be discussed in today's webinar as well. So we are building for some significant capacity. We are building at the moment in Mosbach in Germany. We um, completed a brand new facility in Atlanta last year, and we're about to back around in a brand new facility in China in Suzhou. And of course, on the um, pallet handling, on the, on the material handling platform side, we have a platform strategy which means that all our products are interconnected in some form or manner. 
So um, as I mentioned earlier on, we've got in EMEA, we have a very high utilization of conveyor and sorter production. We are splitting it. So we're making the sorters in the one plant, we're making conveyors in another plant, and we will start that in uh, not January, April 2021, but actually that's in June 2021, we open that ground with an investment of about 45 million euro. As I mentioned in Atlanta, in America, we just recently completed a major expansion there. And in Asia Pacific, we will go live there in March 2022. Finally, here are some of the company's names that you will find our products in. Our, our route to market is through the system integrators. So uh, we are not a system integrator. So we do not do consulting. We do not do planning. We do not do um, full system integration. We are a products and technology supplier. And we supply these products and technologies to both small, medium, and large system integrators and some of the larger customers we have on our panel today, as I mentioned earlier on. And yeah, sure, I hope I made that in four minutes. How did I do? <laughs> Perfect, well done, Hilton. Okay, you can stop sharing and then I'm gonna call on um, uh, Matthias from uh, Schaefer to share his presentation and introduce us to Schaefer. Good morning, Matthias. We can't hear you, you're muted. You unmute yourself. Good morning, everybody. Hello. You can hear me now. You can, yeah, we can hear you and you can share That's your excellent. screen. So, uh, can you see the screen as well? Yes, you can put it into presentation mode and run. All right, here we go. Uh, good morning again. Uh, my name is Matthias Hauer. I'm the managing director for SSI Schaefer in the Middle East and Africa for the last uh, 11 years by now. Um, have come across the region quite a lot. Um, before as well from the Middle East in another role. Um, for the last 13 years, I'm also in the South African market. Uh, Schaefer is a group. I think many of you know the, the history of the company. We are founded in uh, the 1930s in, in Germany. Um, in the beginning, we were a steel manufacturer. And then over the years, and especially from the year 2000 onwards, we were an automation company. Uh, with the acquisition of uh, a number of companies in Europe um, that do system integration. So now we are probably one of the biggest uh, turnkey suppliers of, of logistics installations in the world, and also thankfully in the South African market. Um, our C-level, our uh, executive board uh, that is in, in place right now is, is Mr. Krauss, Mr. Bash, and Mr. Ruckel. I don't want to go into details there. Um, they, they joined the group in the, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, so some of these faces might be, might be new to you. Um, what is our approach to the market? Uh, we really want to be close to our customers, so we are, we are running over 70 subsidiaries all around the world. Um, so we are a turnkey supplier, as I said, so we, we are consulting our clients and we are offering the full range of, of Schaefer products from standard racking to the fully automated solution in all these countries. Um, for the Middle East and Africa market um, that I'm responsible for, we are uh, running three offices in this region. Uh, the head office is in Dubai. We have a second office in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia and um, an office in Johannesburg since 2011, I believe, uh, when we started the operations there. Um, we did this along with a number of large projects in the region. One of them was with Hilton. Actually, it's his fault that we are in South Africa, I would say. Uh, he invited us back then to get into the market and, and join a project with him together with Intero. Um, but we have been successful since then with a number of projects, um, large ones uh, in, in Johannesburg, in Durban, in, in Cape Town as well. So really across the country with over 12 reference sites in automation that we have uh, right now in, in the country. Uh, the team in the Middle East is about 90 people. Uh, that includes service technicians, uh, salespeople, uh, uh, and, and consultants, of course, IT people as well, which is more and more important. I think this will be one of the topics today as well, that, that we are not only selling technology and, and hardware, but we are also selling software by now, uh, which is running all of our systems. So uh, that is one of the key points. So. What does Schaefer offer in the terms of products? We are 
buying in specialized equipment, but we are also manufacturing. So in a typical Schaefer project, 90% um, I would say of the equipment that we, that we install on the site is somehow manufactured in the Schaefer facility. And that is really our big strengths that we integrate our own product. And then we are taking specialized solutions like Hilton mentioned with Interroll for some of the rollers uh, that, we are, that we are putting into our product uh, as, as components. Yeah? Um, the, the overall approach for us is really that we start as a single source. So we start with, with consulting and planning, uh, doing simulation for our customers, um, and up to the point where we take full general contracting, including building and construction in some parts of the world as well. This is mainly in Europe at this point, not so much uh, across the world, but uh, we are taking full general contractor responsibility in many of the jobs that we, that we do today. Yeah. I think that's it for, for me. I think that was hopefully under four minutes and I'll hand Perfect. over. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Let's hand over to Adrian, if you can stop sharing. Adrian, morning, uh, welcome. Morning, Gary, thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. And um, luckily you're in South Africa, so not like Hilton in the UK, getting up like two hours earlier. Yeah, and warmer. <laughs> One hour earlier now, okay, great. Have you got my, have you got my slide there, Gary? No, if you can share your slides, I didn't get the, unfortunately, I didn't get the pack, so Abby has it, unless Abby can share it. Do you have it available uh, to share? Gary, sorry, since I'm co-hosting, I, I can't access the server while I'm, while I'm in okay. Zoom. Adrian, are you able to share it? Yeah. Okay. So, I just need to let me know if it's... Uh... Yeah, that's perfect. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm Adrian Bolt. I'm the general manager of Knapp South Africa. Knapp's been in South Africa for, for 12 years already. Um, Knapp was founded in 1952 with our head office in uh, Hot Bay Graz in Austria. We operate from 53 locations worldwide. We now have uh, over 5,000 employees covering 55 languages, and we've got over 2,000 installations worldwide. Um, so for Knapp, our vision is to, is to be synonymous with lo lo um, logistics. Adrian, and do we do this by bringing the latest. Slide? Adrian, do you just want to put your slide in presentation mode so it's bigger on the screen for people? Uh, there we go, has that helped? No, you're on the wrong screen. If, oops, okay, rather, you've got to swap screens. Uh, how do you do that, guys? Display settings at the top there. Yeah. Down. Swap, swap presentation view slideshow. Press that and then go back a slide. Yeah, I have done. Oops. You, you blacked out your screen in the previous one. Yeah, let, let's try it again. Try share again, Adrian. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 it's fine. Let's see if we can get this. Uh... This is the new world that we're all in. So we're all used to getting interrupted, having dogs walk in on meetings, children screaming, cats crawling over people's shoulders. I said to my wife, you can't walk in when uh, in her pajamas and bring me a cup of coffee. I'm on, I'm on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was actually quite interesting. I had, uh, where we're not seeing yours at the moment, Adrian. You're struggling a bit. No. Just start PowerPoint again. It normally works. That's what the RT guys tell me. Restart your. We pay them lots of money to tell us to restart everything.
Okay, there we go. Does that come up now? Perfect. Well done. All right, so sorry about that. So, so CNAP's vision is to be synonymous with logistics. And um, we do this by bringing the latest technology to warehouse logistics. Together with our customers from around the world, we develop customized systems. So CNAP offers sophisticated solutions um, in its core sectors to the entire supply chain. Um, and as a result, we hopefully change these supply chains into value chains. And that is me, Gary. A lot okay. less than four minutes. <laughs> Good job. Well done. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, next person we've got is Johan Kalvik from Swisslog. He is based in Sweden at the moment. Welcome, uh, Johan. Um, it's nice to have Swisslog on the panel as well. So uh, over to you, Johan, if you've got a quick presentation on uh, Swisslog, an introduction to yourself. Yes, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> let's see if I can. I may be facing the same, same problem as Adrian is sharing the wrong, um, wrong screen. Uh, is it the, do you see my full screen or my presentation mode? We see your slides. We don't see your full screen. Yeah, yeah that there better? We go. that's better. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me as a guest here. And uh, my name is uh, Johan Kjellvik. Uh, so I'm working as a senior sales manager. And I have a little team of uh, salespersons selling our own pro produced products into uh, the, uh, the world of independent system integrators. So many others, many, many of you maybe know, know each, us only as a system provider, but we also now are in the product sales uh, uh, sector. So, um, I'm based here in, uh, at the Swiss Log Technology Center here in Sweden, and it's, uh, we are based here on pallet technology, and then we have divided our operations in several other technology centers, such as in uh, Austria with the light goods, Switzerland for so software, and in Germany for robotics. So a little bit about myself is that I've been now in export sales for the last 25 years and had, uh, had a very nice opportunity some uh, 10 years ago to uh, spend one year in South Africa. So it's a lovely country and uh, hope to come back soon then to uh, after the pandemic to see what we can do. So far, we haven't done much uh, from Swiss log side in uh, South Africa. We have just uh, one uh, small uh, installation in uh, in South Africa and one also a larger one in Algeria. Maybe for the audience today, we are maybe not so well known as the others, but I would say that we are playing in the same league as uh, the fellow panelists here. Uh, we are 2,100 people in logistic automation within Swisslog. We have another 800 when it comes to hospital um, Logistics, maybe you know us a little bit from that part of the market as well. Uh, we are owned by KUKA, so together with KUKA, we uh, are about 14,000 people. And um, we have, including the KUKA offices, uh, plus 100 offices worldwide. Here are some uh, interesting milestones for us. So we started a long time back, but uh, I would like to highlight that. Uh, the company where I worked for is, uh, we, we came up with the first stack of crane in 1969. And so we have now made uh, more than 4,000 stack of cranes. And I would say we are in the, in the, in the lead there um, with the nowadays very tall cranes. Many of our cranes we sell nowadays are above 40 meter high. We are also, uh, a large reseller of the auto store. Uh, we have, um, we were acquired by Cook in 2014. 
we uh, ever since then started to uh, develop our products together with KUKA. So we have a, always a, a touch of uh, robotics in our sense of new technology nowadays. So here's an overview of what we can offer for a full logistic solution. So we have the uh, Vectura stacker cranes. We have the pallet shuttle store uh, storage, which we call power store. We also have the Promove pallet conveyors. So that forms our pallet technology. Then we have the light goods technology with the Tornado mini load crane, the cyclone carrier, and also the uh, quick move case conveyor system. So um, we have our own production of all these products and we produce um, in Sweden, Austria, and China. And um, yes, uh, as you can see here, we are, so we are focusing mainly on the three main areas, retail and e-commerce, pharma, food and beverage, and then also, of course, some other uh, special areas such as uh, tire industry, and the car industry. Nowadays, a lot of things go uh, in our development is to get KUKA together with Swisslog and try to make use of the robotics competence within KUKA. We, of course, uh, try to see in the crystal ball what mega trends are coming in now and try to adapt to new customer behaviors and need for intralogistic solutions with a last mile solutions and so on. So um, I guess that all of also other the panelists here are looking at the same things here with the micro fulfillment centers, etc. So um, yeah, let's say that I think that's, I hope I made it also in, in four minutes here. Well done, so, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Okay, and lastly, but not least is uh, Marcus Andorfer from TGW. Welcome, welcome, Marcus. Perfect, thank you very much, Gary, for handing over. And thanks a lot also for the invitation. I quickly try to share my screen with you guys. So uh, short introduction to TGW and what we are doing. Uh, we are situated in Austria in beautiful wells in Upper Austria, which is halfway between Salzburg and Vienna. We were founded in uh, 1969. It's one of these um, garage stores, which moved now up to a global player in intro logistics. Um, nowadays, we are like 3,800 employees. Uh, in our last fiscal year, we did uh, 835 million euro. Um, I can already tell you a little secret. Um, with end of June, which is our end of fiscal year, we will uh, hit the 1 billion this year, which is a big goal for us um, and also shows like in which direction the whole company is uh, moving. Um, we have 20 locations uh, worldwide, which include also production facilities, uh, of course, here in Austria. Uh, in China and in uh, North America. Um, what is uh, probably the mo most uh, interesting thing uh, for you is like uh, how we do business, how we approach uh, the market. Basically, uh, we have uh, three business segments. This is on the one hand, uh, the integrated systems, which means like uh, TGW is delivering turnkey solutions to the end client, uh, which means starting from uh, the mechanics to controls to IT integration and SAP solutions. In this area, uh, we are uh, strongly focused in uh, three core industries, which are basically uh, the fashion industry, e-commerce and industry and consumer goods. Um, and um, yeah, 
The second pillar is like everything around services. So when you go with TGW, we are not just like uh, serving you a site and then we are gone. Um, if you want, uh, you get from us a 360 degree service solution and after sales solution, what comes down to maintenance, spare part management, uh, um, like remote ma maintenance. Um, we're using their all technologies which are available nowadays and which may be a topic later onwards in nowadays discussion. Um, yeah, and the third pillar, uh, how we approach uh, the market and how we work is, uh, uh, it's called the mechatronic subsystems. Um, there, uh, it's basically our product um, business where, de where we deliver the um, mechatronic components like um, conveyors, storage solutions, stacker cranes, uh, shuttle solutions uh, to our international partners who are situated worldwide, who are doing then the integration work and the turnkey solution for you as an end client. Um, this uh, structure as we, hear, uh, as we have it here now makes, it pretty, uh, makes us pretty flexible, which means like um, the big projects in our core markets uh, where we can um, focus on our industries and our te technology. Uh, we, uh, we would uh, be present as an integrator to, uh, who delivers the turnkey solution. But for example, if we talk now about like um, markets where TGW is not present, um, we would then look for a partner, for example, who has experience in this region who has experience maybe of, of, of like uh, uh, integrating the technology there. And then we would deliver the, uh, the mechatronic solution there. And uh, what comes down to what can we deliver there? It's basically almost every equipment you need for an intra logistic so solution nowadays. And uh, this is exactly also how we approach at the moment the African market. So TGW is at the moment uh, uh, not present uh, as a whole system integrator. We work in Africa through uh, partners and uh, international partners who have projects there. Um, for example, at the moment, I'm building a facility with conveyor technology in Angola, uh, where we have a partner who is basically specialized in, in, uh, in money handling and we deliver the mechatronic solution for their turnkey solution. Well, uh, keep it short and simple. That's it from my side. Thanks a lot. Marcus, thank you. So thanks guys. Um, I think that was a good introduction to all the companies that we have here. And it's actually uh, quite nice that we've got people that are direct competitors, but actually are suppliers to each other as well. It show shows how this industry is quite interrelated. And uh, in my history and my people at Relog, we've worked with all of them. We've had some installations from all of the suppliers and dealt with all that equipment. So it's all very, very successful equipment. I'm gonna to start to share the main presentation. Uh, let's hope this works. And can you see my screen? Is the right screen being shared? Yeah. Okay. So really just as a bit of a background, um, automation and mechanization is really progressing at a significant rate. We see the technology developing. I mean, automated cars coming and the software and computer systems has grown at such a rate that the, uh, what you can do today with technology is really significantly different than what was 10 years ago. There's a new technology being launched and developed daily. The majority of the supply chain infrastructure developments internationally, if we go look around the world, if we can travel, has some form of mechanization of automation. I haven't been into a facility in the last five years that is a purely manual facility when you visit international sites. The question is, how does this affect us in South Africa and Africa? Can we benefit from these developments in new technology? Are automation and mechanization developments applicable in a developing market where we have high unemployment and low labor rates? Obviously, the adoption of technology comes with a cost and must have a payback. 
how do we justify and get the payback to work in a developing country with our lower labor rates? So hopefully I'm going to get some answers today from, from the team out there. And my slide is not moving. Let's hope this works. Okay. Uh, going back a little bit, historically, the first automated warehouses started with ASRS automated storage and retrieval. Uh, as Swisslog said, they were one of the first in the space. Uh, vertical cranes used store pallets, which allowed us a significant height. And it was really motivated on space and the ability to also depreciate the full building as equipment, rack supported buildings. It was simple and reliable technologies. Some of the disadvantages were you needed double handling to feed separate pick areas, or you would have to integrate multi-level mezzanines into the crane system, complex limiting. And they were inflexible for peaks. You were limited to the capacity of a crane. It was quite expensive at the time. It's less common today, but unless land and space is critical, but it certainly is part of an integrated system when we see in today. So it's not that it's gone away, but it's not used by itself as a full automated solution. It's part of an integration. The next level of automation progress to sortation. Um, sortation was really used to try to give a pick of products in an automated manner. It, it's not been that successful in retail as it's difficult to pick store friendly orders. Okay, and retailers, they've realized that the supply chain needs to make the stores more efficient. Um, labor savings, not as significant as it often is uh, uh, promised, because you actually need to divide the total labor by two, because you've got a lot of people at inbound and people at outbound, which you've then got to balance to the capacity coming through. It does give good speed, capacity, and accuracy, and it's still used obviously in the courier and parcel business and uh, for consolidation of picked orders. So it's not a technology that's gone away. There's lots of new developments, new equipment giving many options and applicable to optimize space, throughput, accuracy and labor systems. So we're starting to see a lot of automated guided vehicles, a lot of mini loads, a lot of other technology. We're starting to see robotic units that like the Kiva system that Amazon has that moves the stock to the tax stations or uh, some sort of um, vending technology that they use in the pharmaceutical industry for small parcel picking at a very high rate. Uh, the shuttle technology has taken off at an amazing rate and really it's changed the whole uh, options that one has for automation. Um, and the, um, the next one is these auto stores, which is really working well with uh, e-commerce and fulfillment and really gives a great density of systems. And it's very, there's no auto stores yet in South Africa. Be exciting to be putting in the first one, hopefully soon. Um, and then there's, a, uh, as, as we've moved, the current focus in relation to automation is in, in really it's moved towards achieving very high pick rates, accuracy, but now store friendly pick. So the biggest cost in retail is in the stores. They do their own merchandising overseas. In South Africa, we pay companies to do merchandising. And with the higher cost of labor, you really want to bring that down. So they pay, uh, in Europe, for example, it's six to 10 times what we pay in South Africa. So a big motivation was to get uh, savings in store. And with the latest technology and software and intelligence, we can build systems that will pick each store's orders in a sequence to put that particular store layout. So when that roll tainer or pallet gets to that store, it's exactly configured in a reverse drop sequence of re-merchandising that store. Okay, and that really takes out a lot of the compromises that we have. And you cannot do that without automation and the, um, and the technology that's available, but the paybacks are very different. Um, the latest developments around AGVs have, which have significant intelligence and that can uh, speed up operations and move things in a very nice way from different points and take out the restriction of, of conveyors. 
is also changing things. So one's got to be really clever as a consultant or as a designer to be able to take advantage of all the different technologies that are out there and actually use it in a design that's hopefully going to give the results for the customer. Uh, what's to automate? Repetitive tasks, when you want accuracy, when you want throughputs, when you've got high labor costs, when you want fast response, and if you've got space restraints. There are risks, the high capital cost, understanding the supply chain needs and understanding the flexibility you need. So making sure you build that in, because if you build it too rigid, you become very focused and you cannot adapt to a changing market. You've got to test it properly before go live. You've got to simulate it and understand. And you've got to understand you need a different level of support on skilled on-site operators and technicians. And I suppose the big question is, do we have a choice or can we stay behind and become redundant? Um, what is the general trend? What will the new day bring? New markets, new businesses, new challenges. What do you need to remain successful in the future? And that's, you know, just, it's gonna be changing our whole world. But I suppose there are some things that are not worth automating. So hopefully we have some manual things in life. Okay, let's go move on to the first question. So with the development of AI, IoT and other technologies, how is this changing? The approach to mechanization and automation, what are the latest trends and developments? Any chance that our panelists are gonna share some interesting secrets. The first panelist is Hilton. Sorry, Hilton, we got you first again. This is okay. your slide. <laughs> Jump in. All right, I'm not unmute, unmuted. You can all hear me still though. Yeah. Okay, so um, I suppose I've, I've got um, quite a significant benefit that I've spent a lot of my time in South Africa. I started my career in this exciting world of materials handling and intralogistics in South Africa. And now I look forward to the next 20 years here in a developed first world country. So I have seen two different worlds here. Um, I can speak obviously on behalf of, of um, Interol. We have no doubt a very aggressive um, innovation product roadmap. And it's all about developing smart products. And it's all about developing products that are somehow connected to software in a very intelligent way enabling um, our customers to be able to use this technology to be able to make their solutions digitalized and even smarter. So um, to answer the question quite simply is that um, we are de developing these products at a very rapid pace. Um, we, we, we launched our first um, <clears throat> smart product last year with our DC platform. Some of you might be aware of some of the technology in conveyors, which are um, these rotors that only run on demand. And um, of course, there's significant benefits of this type of technology, which all the companies are using today, which allows you to save a tremendous amount of energy and reduce your maintenance and reduce noise levels and all the rest. So we brought a product to the market, which allows now for customers to be able to get real diagnostics from these products. So there's a genuine feedback system, which allows us to determine the health of our products. And this of course is um, ensuring that the end customers don't have any critical failures or unscheduled breakdowns. And this comes across the word of um, preventative maintenance. So this, I think, is very, very important because as we'll discuss a lot today, is that when you go from mechanization to automation, you become more and more dependent on the whole solution. And of course, uptime and availability is absolutely important. And I can understand why all large integrators offer um, lifetime services, as my colleague from TGW highlighted, that you need to um, be able to offer um, support 24 hours, um, seven days a week. So when you're doing that, you want to be able to respond quickly and cost effectively. So another um, um, journey that we're having towards smart solutions, smart products, the internet of things, is that we are going to be also um, developing a product, which, well, we launched a product this year called the Smart Pallet Mover. And uh, We'll talk a bit more about that, but really this is another product which is also connected to, to an upper IT level system, which allows for communication between these two systems to manage the process in movement of goods. Um, in this case, from a pallet full or empty to a machine. So it's almost like a goods to man, 
but it's in a very low throughput environment. So we're targeting specifically companies in the manufacturing logistics, not in the typical space of retail and e-commerce and fashion. So yeah, so so Interall is, I would say, pioneering Nothing, the- Let's keep it to two minutes. Oh, okay, let me know how I'm doing. We're pioneering our way there. <laughs> and we're two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on. cool. Thank you. That's it. Uh, let's move on to uh, Matthias and see what Schaefer has to say about that question. Uh, um, I think you mentioned earlier that, that uh, um, automation is mainly a topic for, for, the, for the markets in Europe and, and Western markets, but I, I think I disagree with that. I mean, what we see from all of our customers that we have a growing demand for flexible and scalable solutions. Yeah? And some of them are fully automated, some of them are semi-automated, but the demand is, is pretty much the same all over the world. Um, of course, with different, different levels of technology that you use. Coming to the topic of AI and IoT, um, Hilton mentioned that, that sensoric smart devices and so on are more and more used and components are more and more used. We do exactly the same, but, but I think you have to go a step further. You need the, the software um, that, that really analyzes and, and predicts the things that will happen. So not only preventive, but predictive maintenance. and, and um, to predict your business that will happen in the, in the future. Um, for us, that is, is the key today to have a software solution integrated as well. Um, and, and that is really then driving your supply chain. So um, we, we see these trends for the last, I would say, 10 years or even more. But now the IoT and AI technology allows us to, to really uh, get into this predictive market of, of what will happen. Um, the, the, the topic of uh, uh, big data, I think uh, Johan had this in his slide before that year on year, 40% more uh, big data is, is, is basically uh, collected. Yeah? And, and that is the same in the logistics side as well. We are collecting data and we are trying to analyze this data to, to predict your business, to predict your uh, um, correct strategies uh, in the software that allow you flexibility for any, any future growth. And of course, one very important topic for automated solutions is to increase the utilization. If you want to go into uh, an automated solution and design it on a peak um, performance, you might have 300 days a year where this system is standing idle. And that is, that is not the task as well. So you have to be smart uh, to, to uh, optimize the right tasks, that your utilization of this system is, is really up. Otherwise, you have a standing dinosaur there that is, that is not giving you any, any type of performance. Okay, thank you, Matthias. And let's move on to Swisslog, Johan. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Guys, we will we will swap around the sequence of answers. So don't. don't yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, exciting. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, quite a lot of my um, since you have asked for some uh, future uh, perspective and so on. I would say uh, quite a lot of what I intend to say today is that we have this strong relation with our mother company, KUKA Robotics. So we uh, try to take every opportunity to find synergies between our two companies. There, therefore, you will see a lot of uh, with the developments uh, in, in the picking and um, uh, placing applications. So um, I, I, you can see my picture here on the left hand side with the so-called item pick with the KUKA robotic uh, uh, unit and then we have developed this uh, picking hand, hand uh, that the product it's it's named the uh, item pick uh, and as you I mentioned before we have uh, sold quite a lot of uh, uh, auto store units uh, which is unfortunately not our own product <laughs> I wish it would have been but uh, now we are coming and approaching our customers uh, with, to whom we have sold this uh, auto store solutions to also add now the picking solution at the, so that we have the front end solution here. Yeah, let's, I, I think that's enough of, 
of what I want to convey here at question number one. So okay. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and now let's move on to Adrian at Knapp. Uh, thanks, Gary. So one of the developments with with AI is uh, is machine learning, and and we probably. Um, all looking at that, but that's where you recognize patterns based on um, existing algorithms to develop um, corresponding solutions. So it just means that the the system takes artificial knowledge and and this is generated from from experience. Um, the, the system is provided with sufficient data and rules, so it's it learns by itself what products um, it can it can pick automatically without um, just a, a additional software being put into the system. And that's something that we use in our pick it easy robot. Um, so it, when the robot is picking a product, it will know um, at what speed it needs to pick. Um, are we picking up um, a cylindrical or a square product and what that product is, is made of, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's a, a pharmaceutical product in a cardboard box or a bandana in a plastic wrapper, um, this gets learned automatically by the system. And, and this type of technology is, is, is certainly um, taking the world of logistics a, a lot further. I think there's some exciting stuff happening and you haven't touched on your AGVs where they're self-learning technology as well. So that's gonna be exciting as we go through things. Lastly but not least, let's move over on to Marcus and TGW. Perfect. Well, as already heard now before, uh, everything will be about data, but not like uh, only just about data because um, data is like really the raw material, you know, you have to figure out like where to get it, um, how to get it, I feel like um, there, there was a lot of progress already made. The next step is of course, like what do we do with data? Like how can we analyze it? How can we find patterns? And at the end of the day, get uh, an advantage for our intra logistic solution out of it. Um, as Adrian already pointed out, like applications can be like self-learning systems. So basically that uh, a picking robot like uh, knows of course, like what he's picking, but also what it makes it like pretty interesting is like if there's an, a new product, a new carton coming and like um, the robot makes maybe a first picking mistake and can't pick, I don't know, the tea bag or the screw. Um, he can tr try it two, three, four times. And uh, if he's successful, he will learn that how to pick it, how to, to grab the, the difficult item he wants to get and this information is then like uh, not only used for this single uh, operation and for the single facility the future is of course like if you have more warehouses that they are all connected and if you have this problem once it should just happen once because all the other sites all the other systems will learn and will apply this knowledge you got already out of your system. Um, other like applications are like everything about like uh, lifetime services after sales, like predictive maintenance, like that uh, we get the information out of uh, the system, uh, which maintenance you have to do, which components uh, you have to, to, uh, to take care of. And like, at the end of the day, um, what comes down to component level, the, the single module, the single component, the conveyor element, the transfer, they will talk with you directly, you know, uh, they will tell you what is the situation, uh, what we have to take care about it, and then the layer above will combine all of them in the, the systems solution and there. This makes the system pretty flexible. What comes down the dynamic usage of, of AMRs and HEVs, like AMRs, uh, they uh, in future, uh, you know, they they will just talk to each other. You know, you don't need anything more in the ground. Uh, no, no data line, uh, no energy line. Uh, they, they will have uh, like a Tesla talk to to the other AMR and will transfer the information where to go and how to do this. Yeah, and I feel like most other stuff was already covered. So that's from my side. 
Thank you, Marcus. Let's move on to question, next question. Uh, guys, just uh, people in the audience, we have over 100 participants. Feel free to load a question in the question and uh, answer box and we'll try to get to them during the panel discussion. So with the pandemic and the take up of e-commerce and omni-channel, this has obviously put pressure on retailers to change the way supply chains operate and move to more single fulfillment. Have you seen this as an opportunity for new systems in this area of fulfillment and throughout the supply chain? Is there also any exciting new technology and operations in this space? So let's see who the next person is. It's uh, Johanna, uh, sorry, no, it is, uh, yes, it's Johan from Swisslog. Yes, uh, let's say uh, our take on this is uh, that we uh, now look a lot of uh, the, let's say, last mile solutions and micro fulfillment centers. Uh, so I can reveal what, uh, without saying too much that uh, vertical farming is something that we are exploring and uh, also any kind of solution where we have micro fulfillment solutions close to the retailers and so on. So that's that we think that is the name of the game. So um, let's say it's, uh, Yeah, that, 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 is the, uh, that is the plan. We have made uh, some uh, smaller deliveries within these sectors. And um, uh, I don't know if you have uh, this video clip also. Yes, I can just move on to it. Maybe it can give you a little. Yes, that was just a short little clip uh, about our ideas about uh, uh, micro fulfillment yeah. centers and so on. And um, let's say I think we are a little bit in the beginning of this era. Maybe um, also my take on it uh, for for uh, for a country like South Africa, which has not come to that level of automation. I think uh, the, the basic. Uh, machine equipment that uh, is actually more my normal life of uh, stacker cranes and pallet conveyors and so on is let's say the first step to go to. But let's say it's of course very interesting for us to explore these new solutions with, uh, with this, what we, what we call micro fulfillment centers and also the vertical farming. And we do have one installation in, in the US currently for that one. But I, I think, I hope the future will show more. That is, that is what I have to, can reveal today. Okay. Next one is going to be Knapp. Um, Adrian. Thanks, Gary. So, so we also see a, a big push for, for, for micro fulfillment centers. We have a number of installations, even before the pandemic that we've been doing in Dubai, Australia, New Zealand, and in, in the USA. Um, micro fulfillment is really just a, a, a miniature warehouse which is connected directly to a supermarket. And they cover about a thousand square meters. Um, a, a micro, for, micro fulfillment center is give, capable of giving or preparing up to 750 orders a day. And, and these are usually ready in about 30 minutes for, for collection or, or ready to be, be dispatched with a, a courier system. Um, and the automated system is small enough to be built into the back of an existing grocery store. So um, maybe in South Africa, we have some smaller ones, but, but certainly some of the larger retails have the space where they could put this in and, and, and make use of these facilities. And they'd be able I to think, cover more than just one store. I think with the demise of hyper stores and people moving back to small stores, there's a lot of space at the back of the old hyper stores that this would be ideally suited for. Yeah, yeah, that's what 
So I would agree with that. That's that's where we're thinking. And some of the key benefits of a micro fulfillment center is accuracy, speed, availability, and profitability. But I think I think just going back, it's that you would have one central location, and that would be able to cover an area for for a whole lot of other stores as well. And at the moment, we the micro fulfillment center is centrally based around additional five or six stores. And um, yeah, that's working pretty well. Okay. Let's move on to TGW. Well, like I think the challenge nowadays is like what comes down to the basic um, mechanical te technology. A lot of solutions are already available. The clue and the secret behind this, uh, especially in, in like e-commerce uh, environment is like, taking what we have and combine, combine them in the right way for the end client to, uh, to get uh, uh, and to reach a, the, the goal uh, of a zero touch environment. So for example, like applications and te technologies which work well together and can be combined well together to find really new approaches for the new demands we have there is like uh, the, the picking robots for for loading uh, totes or like um, instead of conveyors use uh, uh, a pocket sorter where you can uh, do like single item storage um, in a half automatized or full automatized uh, way and uh, a good example as already uh, was pointed out like uh, micro fulfillment center the uh, as we call it the omni store concept uh, from tgw where you basically combine a shuttle solution uh, with a i would call it a, a supermarket uh, environment and where you basically then have on the one hand like uh, an, an automated uh, system, but still, like uh, clients can move, uh, go in there, go in in an uh, shopping environment as they're used to, and still have an uh, automation uh, uh, approach there. Thank you, Marcus. And lastly, but not least, uh, Hilton. Yeah. So of course. Sorry. Yeah. Your slides yeah. up. Yeah, geez, if I read that, I'm going to get myself more confused. I'm just going to speak. <laughs> no, but you guys can all see that. So, of course, the, e the, the pandemic has exploded the the e-commerce and the omnichannel discussion significantly. Uh, everybody is now um, demanding, um, you know, an online presence or having to be on an online presence. What we see as an equipment supplier um, here, and I know for South Africa, is definitely happening is that the, the last mile and the sorting is happening at significant volume. So you're picking down to a much finer level, boxes are much smaller, you're sorting poly bags. And if, if we call this, if we keep this simple, and if I just look at the South African market in particular, which of course, whatever we talk about today that's happening in the first world countries will be applicable to South Africa. It's just a question of when it's gonna be applicable. But what I think is necessary right now is for um, these people in our audience to think about how will you be sorting in order to be able to, to sort this high volume of demand if you have an online presence and be able to deliver this to the customers or for a pick and collect type arrangement. So we, I can say, are seeing an explosion in the demand for sortation technology. And um, that's also one of the reasons why we also um, launched the split tray sorter this year which is of course also sorting um, at, at unbelievably high rates or, or medium rates, not the highest rates, but medium rates into cartons. And um, if I was somebody in the retail space and I needed to go and have an online presence and looking through the different processes, I would be focusing quite hard on the last part where we're doing the final sorting to be handed over to a courier or for them to, to even doing um, the last mile themselves. That's, that's how I view it. Thanks, Hilton. So what's really happening is that a lot of the technology is there. It's our ability with the pandemic and the demand for the growth in e-commerce that's forced us to rethink the way we apply it and how we combine different elements mm -hmm. together and using the software and the AI and uh, machine learning to optimize this in a better way. And that's really for significant growth. And I think some really exciting developments have happened in the last 12 months. So even though we've had a lot of negativity with the pandemic. It's actually had some a silver lining uh, on the horizon there, and it's given us some nice developments. Moving on to the last, the next question. Uh, or is that? 
what is that? We should be on question. That was my answer for question number two, but uh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. There we are. Yes, question three. So, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm jump, I'm skipping Schaefer. Sorry, sorry. No, don't, don't worry. I think most of the 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 answers have been given from my my uh, colleagues in the panel already. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I think clearly e-commerce is the big accelerator. Uh, sorry, uh, the pandemic is the big accelerator for the e-commerce push. Yeah. The the trend was there before, but now we are just forced to, and our our customers are forced to across all industries to. To, to implement these solutions. Um, I mentioned it earlier, there's, there's always the, the balancing between the peak, the extreme peaks, especially in e-com, you have these, these Black Friday, Cyber Mondays, these monster sales where you suddenly have uh, five, six times the, the number of orders on a single day, or sometimes even in an hour. I think I heard last year in China, they, they, uh, they sold millions of, of an item in, in less than an hour yeah? uh, during the Cyber Monday sales. So, um, and that is, of course, something where automation then maybe comes also at, a, the, at the, the border to, to be the most efficient solution. Um, but uh, um, the, 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 the technology that we, that we have, of course, with, with additional functions that are in there, um, they are not so much changing, but there are new players entering into the market as well. I mean, you have uh, uh, the traditional 3PL business. Um, that is losing a little bit of track, I think, globally, um, because they are maybe not fast enough um, with their solutions. There are new players in these markets as well. Startup companies, uh, I think uh, Johan mentioned uh, urban farming solutions um, uh, as well. There are a lot of these, these just-in-time delivery companies that are now going into, into e-commerce picking as well, yeah? where they have 45-minute delivery times in, in, the, in the bigger cities. To your doorstep and, and that of course requires completely different different solutions yeah and and the traditional retail is is definitely challenged by that just to, just to add to this i was on a webinar a couple of weeks ago where one of the guys said last year in the uk was christmas every day yeah so their peak just flattened out and they had such a high demand anyhow let's move to the next question automation is an initial cost scare to a company, but in the long term, there's indeed savings. How do you build a business case appropriate to the South African market? I'm looking for answers there because we've got some projects in the pipeline that may need these answers. Let's start off with Kerr. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so so from, our, from our point of view in the South African market in a whole, um, because we don't have the scale, <laughs> Um, normal companies start with a little bit of a uh, mechanization and they start with gravity rollers and that type of thing. And they eventually grow into automation. We, we just had a client in our office uh, yesterday because we, got, we launched a brand new showroom. And uh, the, the customer wanted to see basically how his parcel would go onto an automated uh, system. And with our ZPA, it doesn't have to be too complicated. Um, so you don't have to go to fancy PLCs and everything else. Um, so what, what we advised the customer basically was having a look at, at his warehouse, having a look at his uh, goods receipt area, um, having a look at the storage and distribution area, how does it currently work? And then, of course, his outbound. Um, once you've established those three um, steps in the warehouse or distribution of a product, you can then actually analyze what needs to happen um, and, and look at the current process, um, look at the basically the data and the products that they're conveying, be it size, weight, or, or number of parcels per hour, um, and then look at their future plans. It's, it's really important that before they even look at something like automation, that uh, there's a business buy-in from management that that's the route they want to go and they've got a, a, a growth plan in place. Um, and then, of course, cost of labor. You mentioned earlier, Gary, that um, Europe is six to ten times um, a higher labor cost than what we are in South Africa. And that is a big factor with unemployment rate of 35 percent. Um, you know, the business case isn't always there because you could always throw laborers at the problem to move a parcel. 
However, you then have things like um, the time that it takes to get it there. You have an error factor. Um, you have absenteeism. So all those things have to come into the effect as well and, and needs to be looked at. Um, once you've sort of like ticked off all those boxes, you then need to look at the technology that is available and what's suitable for their process. Um, and then from that point of view, we, we just saying, you know, if, to find the ROI isn't that easy always. And it really has to be a business decision. Um, but there is a break even point at some place in time on your growth plan. So, you know, it, it's just not something you can wake up in the morning and say, okay, I want to automate. It has to be a thorough plan and it needs to be looked at through growth. Thank you. Kurt, uh, obviously there's often hidden ROIs that you actually find out after you've automated and that's, that's the difficulty. You can't actually plan something. So you actually miss out on an opportunity if you cannot calculate everything. Let's move over to uh, Adrian from Knapp. So, so automation does solve a lot of um, challenges with regards to, to labor with uh, the quality and, and, and illness. But you know, if you do automate, you can redeploy these staff to other parts of the warehouse. Um, so automation will bring you increased warehouse throughput. You're gonna reduce your human error you should have fewer shipping errors, greater inventory control, and reduce stockout events. And just overall, a, a long-term planning strategy with the data that you receive from your automation. I think let's move over to Marcus. So basically, besides the point like uh, which were already mentioned, like quality and costs in the system can be optimized. Uh, one also doesn't have to forget the site is just the initial investment and really the tip of uh, the iceberg. So like what we do is uh, we can do a return on invest uh, calculation according to the principle of total cost of ownership uh, in different time uh, um, uh, values. Like uh, for example, um, on 10 years, uh, if you include maintenance, spare part management, energy savings, like how stands this in relation uh, to go for automation? And then at the end of the day, um, you will also find then the right uh, approach because of course, like uh, a zero touch environment is not uh, the solution for all intra logistic uh, uh, system. So we have like um, uh, return on investments on some facilities after uh, one year, one and a half year, because they are basically like Amazon. Uh, we are delivering to Amazon Base, basic, basic conveyor solutions. Uh, we are not talking about the shuttle solution. We are just talking where people are, ba are basically throwing cartons, poly bags on our conveyors. And this solutions, for example, which is all, has also uh, a, a value of a couple of millions uh, uh, was like reached a return on investment after one and a half year. So like, uh, it really depends uh, to find the right uh, solution, communicate it then the benefits on the long run. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, uh, next person is going to be Swisslog. Johan. Yes. Uh, yeah. Let's say as being last in the in the round of questions, it's uh, most of the things have already been said. But I, I would say that it's uh, on my. Um, Last line here, it's, uh, we see it very much of a step-by-step -step, uh, process. And I also see it, if, if we have a look at it from our side, as for me as a salesperson that meets quite a lot of people in an initial stage and, and also with my background of, uh, of East Europe, Russia, Asia, and also my experience from my year in South Africa, I can for sure understand the challenges about finding a good ROI on such an investment, but I'm, I'm, I call it born optimistic that uh, we, uh, we try to attract those customers that are really willing to make the travel together with us. 
I'm sure that on each market there are uh, uh, customers who, who looks ahead and, th and really at, at this point of time uh, when they are not fa have not yet started with automation that they understand that I, I would say that automation is, is a must when growing the, the company. And then we would like to approach those companies uh, with any kind of uh, what our, from any product from our, let's say, wide product portfolio, and then um, continuously work together. And, and, and I would say that we have so many good examples where we have good relations, long-term relation, and we can see that we have been an important uh, part of the company's development towards automation. So, and and if the if the customer or the the field of operation that the customer is in, or the management, or if there is no money in the pocket to pay the investments, etc., then then we let's say we rather go to somebody else, so to say, and 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 work and and find and pick the raisins out of the cookie on each market. And uh, for sure, we 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 know that. Uh, or markets will develop towards automation sooner or later. So we're here to, to, to reach out a hand and help and, and be a long-term partner. And lastly, on this question is uh, Schaefer. Yes, um, so, so from our view, um, I think the history has shown us already that automation does work in South Africa and, and it works at completely different exchange rate of the RAND as well. That was one of the big topics in the last couple of years that the devaluation of the RAND would make automation even more expensive because of the most of the equipment is imported. But um, we really have a history of, of 12 years now with fully automated projects in the country in different sizes. Um, but there was no common recipe for, for each of these projects that we have, we have implemented. I mean, maybe if there is a common recipe, then we, we in all of these projects, First of all, we have a local approach as well. So our local general manager, Sheldon Ois, is also in the call today with the localization of our team. I said that in the very beginning. Um, so that is very important for us as a company as well. So we don't fly in from, from Europe and, and just say, okay, a European solution will work for every market. Um, we try to understand our customer's business. Um, when we deem it absolutely necessary, we, we go for an automated solution but not when it's technically possible. And I think that is really the key as well. Uh, technically, you can automate every single process nowadays from, from robotic solutions to, to whatever. Yeah? Uh, really zero touch technology, I think Marcus mentioned it for, uh, earlier. And we do that in some of the countries, but, but that is not the right technology, I think, for, for an emerging market or for, for a country where the labor costs are in the range that you have in South Africa. So we have to find a middle way, and that is really the key to success in all the projects we have implemented in the past. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. We're gonna be running out of time. I wanna try a lot some time. So if we can keep our answers quite quick and short. Automation and mechanization require different mindsets and management philosophy. Sometimes they're less flexible. The payback and viability is also driven by scale. Do you see the South African market as a challenge to get this to work, and how would you approach it? Uh, first person, TGW. Perfect. Marcus. So like as already like um, mentioned before, like um, the there is no like the solution, and like when we talk about zero touch solution, this may be uh, be applicable for for some environments, for some system. But at, at the end of the day, you really have to find the right degree uh, of automation. Uh, and this is definitely uh, the key factor of like uh, realizing an inter-logistic project uh, uh, in South Africa. So like uh, really like be careful, um, taking care of, even if there are fancy solutions out there. And I see it a lot of times that um, um, end clients Against partners um, got from some trade show the new sub shuttle solution or saw uh, the pocket sorter. And uh, then they're really keen of introducing it or, or using the automatic mobile robots. But at the end of the day, like uh, maybe, you know, like in simple, easy conveyor solution and like uh, having five guys working there is still much more cheaper than 
making fancy automation, even if it's, if this approach is not increasing now my business, but at the end of the day, it's the best of the client. And this like on the long run, uh, this is what the best uh, for, for, for me as a company and also for the end client, for sure. Thank you. And next to Kerr again. Okay, um, so basically with the, the demand of e-commerce, a lot of large customers have actually cha had to change their, their business model. Um, you look at just Edcon, for example, um, too big, too, too focused on retail and uh, not really being managed well. But um, if, if you look at, well, once, you've, once you've identified where the value is, um, I think it's I think it's imperative to actually move across somewhere or another to mechanization and automation eventually. Um, but um, as I said in my previous slide, you really need to look at what your business would look like in the three, five, or ten year time. Um, you know, three PL, for example, they can't really uh, grow the business case because they have a a three year contract with a with an end customer, so they need to try and build that in to their whole work process as well. So it is really difficult, um, and um, we believe with Intro's uh, modular platform, um, you know, a company can grow um, and uh, expand as they require. So you don't have to have this huge initial layout. Um, and you can do it step by step. Great. Next. Ah, you're not the last one, Matthias, for change. Yeah, the, um, I think on this topic, I mean, I think the installation or the size of the installations that you have in South Africa are not really the problem. I mean, we, we tackled this topic before. Um, the South African market uh, require really a large uh, volume of movements. I mean, you have 56 million people, I think, uh, in that range, or is it is it even more? I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but um, I think the demand is definitely there and the volumes that you move around are, are significant. Um, the challenge for many of our customers, I think, is the trade-off between this, this business continuity that they need in, in an environment where, where unions are, are sometimes strong, where where the, the, the quality of the labor is also difficult in some regions of the country. Um, and at the same time, the social responsibility that you, that you have uh, um, to employ people, to bring people into, into jobs. And this all at a very, very low hourly rate. Um, so, so when we try to design these solutions, we try to bring both of it together. Uh, that is really the key for us, uh, and many times also the key for our clients. Um, Modular investments, I think uh, Kerr mentioned it, um, modular systems, scalable solutions, and a step-by-step -step implementation to, to show a growth path into a fully automated site. I think that is really the key for the South African market. Don't go in 100% uh, in the beginning. Um, a project like this will anyways require a plan for, for five to 10 years. Otherwise, you will never make such an investment. So. Uh, um, over this long time span, uh, you will have multiple phases that you have in, in an uh, automated logistics project. And over to Adrian from Knapp. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's a challenge. We already have a number of clients with various size systems, as Ben's mentioned. Um, just to the guys out there, purchase the appropriate level of automation that you need. You can do a lot with a, a good WMS and, and, and some conveyors to take care of your sorting. Um, and then the next step would be to, to increase and, and have a pocket sorter and open shuttle. And then, and then maybe in those five to 10 years, you can put an automated system in. But there's definitely solutions available for, for that first step. And lastly, Johan from uh, Swisslog. Yes. Uh, maybe I don't bring so much news uh, here. I, I know I mentioned that uh, we have three main focus areas, food and beverage, retail and pharma, and they are fundamental sectors in the daily life. So I think that sooner or later, we uh, each market will mature and uh, we are running a strategic, let's say, plan on uh, different markets. Uh, so we, we can see that we follow, the, follow our plan and see that we got the good, uh, let's say the revenue or 
an over on each market in, in a good way. So um, let's say uh, we, we know that there are all, always interesting products in or uh, customers for each market. So, um, I, and also let's say my, my personal take on it is uh, that, uh, let's say, uh, even though we, we know the conditions in South Africa, that there is uh, for sure uh, a new generation growing up and uh, they get more education and they also have a, a higher demand on, uh, on their workplaces and also would in the future require more challenging jobs. So I think those are the type of, let's say the boring low pay job that, that those are the jobs we are taking away and not, but we are creating other more interesting, more professional um, job levels, so to say. So I, I think that's our development of the market strategy and the, the development in each and every society in the world goes hand in hand towards uh, automation. Thank you. That, it shows a, quite a lot of different uh, perspectives, but it actually all ties down to one that it is possible in a South African environment. Uh, next question, automation as it has developed is generally appropriate in the first world. Uh, some people disagree agree with me, but that's good. In the developing market, we have cheap labor, high unemployment. How do you see the development and appropriateness of implementing automation. Some of this is answered previously, but I think there is an approach that each person's gonna have. Uh, and uh, Matthias, we're letting you go first this time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as, as you said, uh, I, I do disagree with that statement that it's mainly the first world setting and, and we have shown that in the past. Um, what, what I think is important for our customers is, is to justify the investment. I think uh, Marco said is in his slide with the tip of the iceberg is really to show the, the total cost of ownership and, and see the entire opportunity that you get with such a system to grow your business. Yeah? And uh, so the savings that you will have are not necessarily maybe in your warehouse facility, but uh, I think Gary, you mentioned store friendly picking earlier. Um, so, so if you receive a box in your, in your store that is totally mixed up and, and people have to run around for three hours to sort the items, into the different shelves or you receive really store friendly deliveries with different product groups um, that, that reduces your, your cost um, in your supply chain at a different point, not necessarily in your warehouse. And that is something where we have to educate also our, our clients and, and tell them, look at these opportunities, look across that, that wall of this, this warehouse facility and, and uh, into your entire supply chain and, and then you will find uh, the, the right, right answers and the ROI that you need to justify an investment into automation. Next person is going to be Knapp. Adrian. Yeah, so order fulfillment is now further stressed by e-commerce. We have um, changing labor laws, minimum wage rates, and demands by companies to get their goods um, uh, a lot quick, a lot quicker. So, the warehouses that were just doing the, the normal store fulfillment are now taking on that the pressure of getting the the e-commerce out. So, automation is definitely becoming more productive than than what it was um, previously, and the benefits are are definitely there. Um, and again, it's it's those other arguments, you know, about your staff in the warehouse shrinkage, um, and and just how quickly you can get those orders out. Thanks. Uh, Kerr, from an interrupt perspective. No, so, so you are right, Gary, we, we have answered the, this question in various aspects. Um, but um, Mateus, just going back to your, your, your comment. Yes, we do have about 56 to 58 million registered South Africans, but only about 10% of the population have actually had access to e-commerce. Um, so when you look at, you still have the, the traditional spaza shops, the traditional um, locations, um, and they don't come into the mainstream of, of e-commerce or, or that type of thing. So yeah, labor, big issue. Um, and, um, but when we do look at, we are almost probably five to 10 years behind the trends of Europe. So um, the micro performance is gonna become a big issue. Um, in various locations, South Africa is a big, a big country uh, with various provinces. 
Um, so, yeah, that, that's one of the points. And then, of course, the second thing is that whole return logistics is expensive to get the goods back. So, you know, it has to be in consideration um, when they look at automation. So, yeah, getting it right the first time is important. And, of course, choosing your right partner that is going to be there for the long run. Um, that's actually got some some footing and every single company in this panel actually has it. So, you know, we're sitting with good company. Okay, and then over to Swisslog. Okay, let me just get my mouse to move this thing. Yeah. Yeah, let's say it's very interesting to listen to uh, my fellow panelists here and uh, can flatter even though we are competitor with Schaefer. I think that what Matthias said concluded very much what I would like to add to question number five and also my take on question number four. So um, the good summary he made there. So um, let's say I, I just said that I have been working quite a lot in um, India, Thailand, China, etc. Not so much China lately, but China 10 years ago. And um, we can for sure see that there is a great need for automation and just that there are, just to find the right, uh, uh, let's say, long-term partner to work step-by-step -step with development. So um, that's, um, I, I see a bright future and, uh, no, uh, no specific uh, challenges for South Africa here. So, the good signs. So, um, yeah, that's my. Um, I can also admit that, as I said in my introduction, that we have not yet done much in um, in uh, in South Africa. And uh, the part of what I represent for Swisslog is the products. Uh, so we are often uh, working hand in hand with an established. Uh, and well, well established uh, integrator. And the project we did in South Africa was uh, with KNAP. So, um, yeah, let's say that's, that's for information that we are not the one who front the, the, the end customer, uh, at least not from our product sales division. Yeah. And I think you're handling Schaefer Bins. <laughs> We are, <laughs> it's, it's, and that's that's the unique thing of today's session. We've got all the competitors to get today in one environment, which is very unusual. If you went to a trade show or went to Logimat, you talk to them separately. We're talking to you all together, and that's what we wanted to create with this uh, webinar, which is great. Uh, over to uh, Marcus from TGW. Thank you very much. Um, what do we just want to add is like, um, besides um, always doing the, the return on investment on labor costs, you know, sometimes uh, there are environments also which are not human friendly or like a human even can't be present. Like, for example, deep freeze and environments. We have like deep freeze applications uh, uh, for shuttle, for stacker queens. Our whole conveyor technology is, is, is done up to minus 30 degrees. Um, for example, environments for uh, oxygen reduced environments uh, in the chemical industry. So these are all like an environments where you be besides like labor costs, there are actually other factors, you know, why you need automation. And um, also like some in environments um, where the human factor may be and uh, can be present, but may uh, uh, like be a risk, for example, like uh, uh, with damaged items or like even uh, a theft, uh, if you were talking about like money handling or luxury goods handling. So like these are all applications where like uh, a highly uh, aut uh, automation solution or a zero touch solution could be, for example, also applicable um, for uh, South African market. Thank you. I just want to add, um, and it was brought up, the South African market, not all of our market is traditional retail, about 45% uh, shop in the informal sector. And in different African countries, it goes up to about 95% in the informal sector. Uh, we're doing a very exciting project for the last two years with a company in Kenya called Twigger Foods, which supply the informal sector, but by being creative in what they're doing, we're putting in mechanization and very sophisticated systems in the back end. So they've got uh, track and trace with RFID, 
uh, NFC chips. We're using blockchain in their supply chain coming in. Uh, so a lot of opportunities to use mechanization exist even in the informal sector and third world, not necessarily at the customer facing side, but in managing the supply to them. So I think one has to be able to be very creative in how one thinks about return on investment. Uh, it's not only a cost of labor, but also opportunities of what you can do and grow your business and what results you get in your total cost of ownership. Coming to question six, we understand that one might have to give up certain freedoms or flexibility when using mechanization or automation. Um, I must say that with the latest technology, it's becoming less stringent. However, one would expect a fair amount of control over the process and insights as how we how the volumes are moving through the system. Besides normal dashboards of volumes processed versus remaining to be processed or throughputs per station, what other insights are normally discovered post automation? I think this is an exciting question and let's jump right to Knapp. Adrian. But, so Knapp has found that customers want the data to, to add more value. You know, data is the raw material of the future. And, and with certain programs like our TSOS analytics, um, customers want to start using this to, to identify trends and business forecasts. Um, information sorting uh, sorted according to target groups, um, which will help the business to make decisions and, and simplify processes with, within the business. Um, we also have Red Pilot software, which is used from a production perspective, um, which when those trends are identified, you can switch on your shifts really quickly or, or have less people available. And that software also allows the, the, um, the shift workers to, to log in directly through an app. So it just gives the business more control, um, probably with less people in the facility at that time. Okay, and moving on to uh, Swiss Log, Johan. Yes, um, <clears throat> let's say, uh, I, I think we are actually hand in hand with the, the end customer creating a better company in many aspects so that we get a higher quality in delivery. We get a better competence regarding uh, the logistic flow in the com company. We actually create a better workplace for uh, for the end customer to to become a more attractive employer. We get we reduce uh, the number of accidents when having a lot of forklift drivers run, running around or driving around on the shop floor. We also provide for higher capacity. So uh, I think we 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 uh, really help the customer to take the next step for the future, not only to have a automatic warehouse, but also to, uh, to let's say, to develop the company in the, in, in the right way to be more, I would say, more professional, more attractive, and more successful for the future. Okay, let's move to the next person, and that will be TGW, Marcus. So basically, our like like ideas, um, what comes down to after like all the uh, facility uh, is uh, optimized uh, and like a, a good mechanic and uh, IT system is running is still as long as you don't have like uh, a, a dark flow environment and no people are working there uh, anymore. You have to consider uh, the human factor in such uh, an environment. And uh, they are basically, uh, you have to think about like, how, how can we in, uh, influence, how can we make uh, the work better for the person who is working in an uh, intralogistic uh, automation system? How can we increase performance? And these insights are also gained through out of the data which we acquire through our uh, automation part. So for example, like at the moment, uh, we are looking in topics like um, um, how can like performances uh, dashboards maybe motivate people in picking process. Uh, what is about ergonomics? Ergonomics are a huge uh, topic in Europe. Like we have uh, in 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 our office here, twenty people just like taking care about ergonomics and how you can make 
the, uh, the interface uh, better for the body and also for the mind. And uh, there, I think we are really just like on a, on a starting point. Uh, and uh, it's really like this, the, 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 the start of further insights, which we will gain uh, through data, for sure. Thank you. And next is Interol. Okay, yeah, so... Um, the altar. Yeah, I believe that obviously, I think if companies are going to go down the line of mechanization in the first step and then going on to automation, as we've discussed over the past hour, I believe they really have to have a culture of a long-term thinking approach. I don't think there's um, an immediate quick win unless there's a genuine business case. So you have to have confidence. So when you invest in this type of technology, there are other benefits. And as Marcus had alluded to, we see that um, the right um, mix between mechanization and automation can bring benefits to the workforce, but there has to be a complete vertical acceptance of this type of um, this type of mechanization. We need the people to buy into it, and they must work with the processes that are mechanized, automated. And unfortunately, if that doesn't happen, then you may not be able, be able to realize your full benefits short term. So you have to have a bit of a paradigm shift, maybe even a bit of an education, which people will really feel bought into this process. Because if you don't buy them in you're going to be um, going on an uphill battle. But once it's employed, yes, um, you're going to be able to, to get benefits of an improved health and safety and ergonomic type environment. You quite often could find the environment to um, be less noisy, which will be much more friendly on the people. And I'm a big fan of incentivizing remuneration, combining mechanization, as, as Marcus also mentioned. And I think that could even help to get the, 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 the employees to buy into this. But if you don't do that, you're going to have a hard time, and I've seen it personally, so I think it's, it's, it's an area that you should be focusing on. Okay, and lastly, last uh, person is Matthias from Schaefer. Sorry that we throw you in last again. No, no, don't worry, a lot of things have already Thanks been answered. I just wanted to, to, to give a bit of an example. I think really the biggest gain or also the challenge that, that our customers have, and, and that will determine if they are successful or not, is really the time and the quality to market. So, so we have customers here or, or, or companies here that are offering same hour delivery. Um, so, so you order on your cell phone and 45 minutes later, it rings on your, on your doorstep and, and you have your delivery. Um, and, and if you wanna do that in a, in a manual solution, it, it's absolutely impossible. Yeah? You have uh, uh, traffic in your warehouse where, where hundreds of people would be running around like, like headless chicken uh, to, pick these, to pick these orders. Um, so, so there are things, systems like simple ones, goods demand principles that we use for years. Uh, I saw also in the Q&A, there was, not, it was a question if old technology that, or not even old technology, but, but reliable technology from Europe uh, is also something that should now be used for, for emerging markets. And I, I think, yes. And, and even, uh, I think Marcus mentioned it from, from Amazon side uh, as a big example, they are not using rocket science in their DCs. Yeah? They are using uh, uh, transportation systems, uh, picking solutions that are very often still manually driven, um, but they are trying to optimize the process. They are trying to, to reduce the the, the speed or they reduce the, the, the time that a product and an order spends into your DC. Uh, and with all this, you get a better performance out of your warehouse and a better performance to your end customer. And that is really the key for all the automation that we are doing. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that's been a great answers and great engagement as a panel. We've got a couple of questions. We've got about 10, 12 minutes to run. I'm going to run through some of the questions, but I think we've broken some paradigms in the expectation and understanding that everyone just looks at automation as a way of removing labor and trying to get a payback only in terms of ROI on labor cost. But there's so many other benefits and soft touches and soft benefits and downstream benefits that unless you're actually analyzing it properly and understanding the full supply chain and business, you actually can miss it out. Um, we hope that we as Relog actually are able to help our customers in that manner to be able to help and drive solutions into the market. Uh, the first question was that uh, designing automation for peak is cost prohibitive. A big issue in South Africa is with our large peak volumes. How do you uh, bank capacity, create flexibility for peaks without investing 
in spare capacity up front, just to help people understand that, that in the Southern Hemisphere, we actually sit with back to school, Christmas holiday, year end bonus, uh, Christmas, all happening one on top of the other in the Northern Hemisphere, that's generally spread out, which helps um, the peak to average. Uh, any thoughts on that, guys? Open to the floor, Hilton. You're muted. I think if the panel can unmute themselves and just jump in. Well, we're still muted, okay. Maybe I jump in for, for some of the solutions that we have developed for South Africa. Um, I, I think we had an example, not from the South African market, but from China a couple of years back, where we built a 20 million euro automated facility, and then the Chinese uh, uh, company on one of these, these peak days suddenly received 150,000 orders in a single day. Um, the system was designed for 20,000 orders a day, uh, and, and what they basically did is they switched it off on that day and started manually, manually uh, to pick the items from, from, from the floor. And uh, of course, that is something you want to avoid. So you should design the system already with these peaks in mind so that you have some kind of fallback scenario that either in a, in a multiple shift model that you say, okay, we are handling the, the peaks in a three hour uh, uh, shift scenario 24 seven. Uh, and we are designing the, the overall capacity of the site maybe to a five shift, uh, um, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry to, a, to a five day uh, um, utilization uh, and that you can handle then these peaks uh, in, these, in these additional shifts. Uh, that sometimes is difficult. You might need temporary labor, but the beauty of then automation is that, that you reduce the complexity of some of the steps as well. So, so it's simpler to bring people in because uh, they do a single, single step, just picking, just putting away. Uh, so you don't have this, this knowledge requirement that you have in a manual operation. Yeah? So somebody needs to know the warehouse, where to go, where a product is placed. All this is going away because the product is coming to you. So there is some possibility as well where automation can support. Yeah, I could add to that, um, if you don't mind, is that I think it, it's not all, always true that if you design for peak, it's cost prohibitive. I think the big mistake that happens is that, to put it into simple terms, if you purchase a conveyor that's traveling at half a meter per second versus a conveyor that's traveling at one and a half meters per second, you don't pay three times more for the conveyor. So the whole idea is to design the system for peak because you must not design it for averages because you cannot bank your peak. Once you lose a second, it's gone. You never get it back. So the biggest mistake that people might happen is that they design it, which they think is an average, which is going to save money. And then when they do get the peak, then the system falls over. You've got to design it for the maximum that you can pay. And it's not so cost prohibitive. Of course, it depends on whether you're receiving, putting away, commissioning, or dispatching, where you're talking about it. But if I can make any suggestion, make sure that when you give us the, well, when you give the, the guys the numbers, don't water them down, give them the highest possible numbers because that will be the best way to design the system. Okay. Let's run to the next question. Um, our traditional manual operations are not really geared to big data collection because that for the most part, real time decision uh, are made by humans and that not recorded. When venturing into a more automated operation, what data does one need to enable a proper understanding of the ebb and flow of operations and where to start with the journey? It's an anonymous attendee, but I'm guessing I know the question, where the question came from. <laughs> uh, who would like to jump in on that? I can start. I think if you don't have the right data and you want to go on the journey of mechanization, you and automation, it's a problem. Um, the, the, the system integrators here have fantastic tools, I think, to ask the right questions and to extract data from your existing systems. So maybe somebody, but you've got to make sure that you provide data that's maybe available in a WMS, but you probably have to carve it out and analyze it with some kind of a study. So that's how I can start the conversation. Okay. Can I? Mark? Yes, maybe I can add a few things also. And let's say it's, I would say that it's quite surprisingly a lot of customers which approach us, which actually do not have call it more or less a clue of their own data and their own needs. It's quite surprisingly sometimes where we get requests that all of a sudden it's uh, maybe uh, 150 pallets per hour and then all of a sudden it's 300 and etc. 
it's uh, so I think it's just a message from our my side is to, to do 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 a proper analysis of the current figures and also a forecast on the next coming years uh, prospects figure so to say I also see that there is a lot of uh, customers that want to uh, let's say maybe I'm saying something which is a contradiction to what I said before because I said let's take the automation step by step but also it's important that taking two small steps is quite costly to say me and my background may, mainly from the stack ukraine business is uh, that um, having five cranes or six cranes is not so uh, big difference in price but sometimes i get the request that they want to buy five cranes and then in 18 months time will expand with a sixth crane and that is no no good uh, payoff on that investment so uh, the message is that you be clear on your figures and also to take significant step for a, a future uh, future need of, of, of the capacity thanks and i mean like when you like, um one of our biggest like you know why you look for a system integrator and when you go with tgw knapp schaefer or one of the big other players is like that they send you a team to, uh, who will do the proper uh data and analysis you know get the, the 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 right raw data get the right oil which we translate then later in and fully like uh working uh mechanic and IT solution. So uh, I would say this is like uh, one of the aspects why you would choose one of going with one of us, you know. I suppose that's a good role for the consultant. <laughs> <laughs> or a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> we have to market ourselves. Okay, let's move to, the, to another question. We have uh, an anonymous question there. What's the investment horizon for automation? Is it 10 years, 15 or 20 years? I can tell you from my experience, I went to visit an automated facility that they did their payback on a 25 year uh, ROI. A yeah. very successful installation. I don't know what's, what's the typical numbers out there guys that you see. It needs to be longer term than the typical three to five years. I think here in, in, in the first world countries, there are business cases. And I think Mark has mentioned that there's a payback that you can get in under a year or just over a year. But um, here in, in the UK and Ireland, typically customers are looking for, for two, three years payback. But I know in South Africa, they're prepared to look much longer term. Yeah, it would have to be. Uh, our, labor, our labor rate just mm. influences that. I did, a, I did a quick on the back of a cigarette box calculation the other day on some automation and it would be a three to four year payback over in Europe and in South Africa we're getting to 30 to 50 years uh, so we have to look for other areas that we can actually motivate from. Yeah, but uh, I, that's why I think it's a good idea to have a hybrid model and I think all of us spoke about this in the panel. You need to de develop a system which is scalable which maybe you don't go for the, the latest and the best robot which is uh, machine learning and making predictive um, decisions but there's a lot of entry level technology, which I think a lot of the, the companies in, in South Africa can benefit from significantly that's already available today. And we see it still being deployed in some of the country uh, companies here in the UK. Not every, some companies really just go for a multi-level peer uh, picking tunnel with a, with a lift on the side of it or conveyors connecting the floors down to a carousel. So it's not like because you choose that kind of technology, you're not making some progress. That already is a really good progress um, if you have no mechanization or automation. And then you just journey it through, but you need to be committed to the long-term thinking and you've got to have a good sort of business plan. I agree with you, Gary. You probably could find business plan or paybacks beyond 10 years quite easily. Yeah, just, no, just no, going think... back into that, if I can jump in quickly. Uh, one of the things we're also seeing is the cost of technology has come down Correct. as with all sorts of um, uh, computerization and Moore's law it has brought things down so it does become affordable some of the t the physical hardware is imported some can be locally sourced yes. some can be integrated different so one has to be very very flexible in what one's doing but we're also seeing a lot of move toward different types of automation 
And I think in the next two to three years, you're going to see your basic MHE becoming ability to be self-driving. So your order pickers, your reach trucks, and that technology will come similar to what's happening with cars in auto. And it's a lot easier to drive an automated reach truck in a warehouse. There's no taxis around. So it requires a lot less algorithms and <laughs> fancy thinking. But I think that's going to be one of the exciting things. I jumped in there. Someone was about to jump in. No, I just wanted to say what, what supports, of course, the longer, longer ROI in an automated environment is that you have a lot less wear and tear and damage to your equipment uh, compared to a manual operation. I think many of you might be worried that hey, when I look at my, my pallet racking that I bought a couple of years ago, uh, three years later, it falls into bits and pieces because of the quality of, of forklift drivers and so on. I mean, the first automated site we built in the Middle East was 1987, and that site is still running, yeah, 300 kilometers north of Riyadh. Um, and uh, so in the middle of nowhere, uh, um, these customers are operating an automated site, fully automated. The only thing we changed there was the IT, because... For a couple of years, uh, the, the DOS systems from the 1980s were no longer supported. Yeah? So we had to move to, to, to Windows, whatever it was at the time, then again, upgrade to, to another software. So um, the hardware is still the same. The crane is still the same. The racking is still the same. Uh, even the conveyors in many cases are still the same. And, and that is really where, where automation supports as well. That the equipment has a lot longer lifespan than manual equipment in a warehouse environment. Mm -hmm. Totally support that. In fact, the site that I spoke about 25 years, the guys estimated the equipment would last 25 years. And in that 25 year period, they would probably change their forklifts and MHG probably seven or eight times. Yes. yes. So that's, that's an interesting thing. We've got a couple of more questions. We've got some questions. We're running out of time. So I've unfortunately got another uh, meeting to jump into. So I really want to. Um, uh, Herodas, we will. I'll send you. I'll send your question out to everyone, and we'll respond to you in writing. Uh, I think that's the last one we're missing. Um, and then, um, guys, thank you for making the time. It's been auspicious to have all of the competitors in one forum. I think we've created something a little bit unique. Um, and I think this was a great webinar. Uh, thanks for the time and the effort in putting it all together. Thanks to my team. Uh, it will be available. There will be a link on our website in our news and events where the uh, video will be uploaded of this, which you can share freely. So thanks, everyone, and thanks for the time. And have a great day and be safe and help distribute vaccines quickly around the world. Very good. Thank you very much and all the best thank to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.